How Stuart McLean made magic out of everyday life, plus the outpouring of grief at his passing. He was like the Norman Rockwell of Canada. He did it with words, not with a paintbrush. The White House reels from an escalating scandal. Amid damning reports, Russia had multiple contacts in the Trump campaign. And some conservatives fight a motion to denounce Islamophobia. These types of motions could lead to bills that limit free speech. What can I say, Stuart McLean wrote just weeks ago, things don't always go exactly as planned. Right to the end, the beloved CBC Radio storyteller took everyday moments and turned them into perfect words. Stories that he told for decades, first in radio documentaries, later through the tales of the Vinyl Cafe. The moment in McLean's own story was the cancer diagnosis that came just over a year ago. And in December, he put Dave and Morley on the shelf. Not for good, he hoped, but Stuart McLean died today. Deanna Sumanak Johnson has more. Stuart McLean became one of Canada's most beloved humorists and storytellers. But if you asked him, he'd say his success was a surprise to himself above all. I mean, I didn't really expect myself to amount to very much either. So I was, uh, I was intimidated by the brains of the athletes all around me and uh, just didn't think I measured up. But McLean was funny. A regular contributor to Peter Zosky's Morningside, he gifted the host a cockroach for his retirement. And, uh... <laughs> Here. I don't want to... <laughs> Say hi there. McLean's great passion was his curiosity about other people and his ability to connect with them. As a reporter for CBC News, he chatted up strangers in hospital cafeterias. I can remember the impact, and it just makes me shudder. And I know that I wouldn't be here today, you know, if I didn't have someone watching out. On trains. Now, I, if I was a mother. And ferries. How do you pay the bills? Uh, well, I, about every second year, I work at the University of California. His eye for finding the extraordinary in everyday life eventually led to his most famous gig, hosting CBC Radio's The Vinyl Cafe, where he told tales from the fictional lives of husband and wife Dave and Morley, their kids, friends and pets. Dave had never put his tongue against the television antenna on a cold night in November. The Vinyl Cafe was a hit. The accompanying books McLean wrote won him the Stephen Leacock Prize for Humor. And she said, you aren't going to believe this. And Morley thought, oh, yes, I am. Three times, and making him a giant among Canada's humorists. The first year I won was one of the few years he was not a, a finalist. And I remember in my, in my you know, back of the envelope acceptance speech that I hadn't really prepared because I didn't think I was going to win, I thanked Dave and Morley his characters in the Vinyl Cafe stories for having a very un quiet and uneventful year because he did not have a book out that year, or I'm sure I wouldn't have won. He also received the Order of Canada and had fans turn up in droves when he started taking the Vinyl Cafe on the road across North America. He'd ask the audience, who's got trouble? And someone put up her hand and say, you know, I'm nine months and two weeks pregnant, so I got trouble. And he'd, he'd talk to that person for a while. He'd make a story out of it. But in between all the laughs, McLean found ways to tackle tough subjects. While promoting one of his Vinyl Cafe books five years ago, he pointed out his characters were now older and that at some point, one of them may die. We'll have to handle it sometime, right? Will we? Well, either that or me. We're going to lose somebody. <laughs> In late 2015, McLean was diagnosed with melanoma, a type of skin cancer. By December 2016, he said he needed further treatment and that the Vinyl Cafe would be put on hold indefinitely. David Morley, whose stories had captivated listeners for more than two decades, had gone suddenly silent. And McLean's millions of listeners had lost a friend, a man who observed everyday life and reflected it back to them poignantly and hilarious. How many people are here and have been here before? <laughs> Stuart McLean was 68. Deanna Sumanak Johnson, CBC News, Toronto.
Listeners and fans from coast to coast to coast are sharing their grief tonight over Stewart's passing and also their appreciation for his talent, his humor, and his passion. Briar Stewart with some of what they're saying. We sold a lot of Stuart McLean books over the years. Whether through his written word or his engaging delivery, Stuart McLean is being remembered by Canadians as a consummate storyteller. I think it appeals to all of us as average people, average Canadians, because he tells stories that are so close to home. Things that might have happened to us or could have happened to us. Dave Conroyer has been a lifelong fan. Listening to the Vinyl Cafe was an indelible part of his family's own Christmas tradition. So it only makes sense that his favorite McLean story takes place during the holidays. The family on their, on their way to Christmas said, you know, I think it to Dave's mom's place and they get stuck in, in a snowstorm and end up in this hotel and the, the lonely hotel keeper and it's, you know, the good Christmas story. That one was always my favorite. Through his humor and folksy narratives, McLean touched Canadians across the country. I love the warmth, the heartfelt warmth of the stories and the laughter. Laughter and the joy. He was like the Norman Rockwell of Canada. He did it with words, not with a paintbrush. He was like, he's going to be sadly missed. He touched our hearts, and uh, I can't believe he's not here. The stories were fantastic. So the fact that Stuart's gone was, well, it's, uh, it's a big loss for the, the radio, radio community and the storytelling community. Including all of those journalists he taught through the years. Up until 2004, he was an instructor at Ryerson University. He was engaging. He made you feel like you were the most important person in the room when he was talking to you. You mattered. Um, he really listened to what you had to say. And that's what really resonated with those who work at Edmonton's Jubilee Auditorium. He's been here every year for 20 years. Here's to another Christmas. Here's to turkeys, frozen and thawed. Every Christmas, McLean did a show here, and every time, they were sold out. He was always very gracious to ask the staff about themselves and families, very interested in cultural heritage of families. Um, he remembered people's names. It was, he was a unique and very special man. Now being widely missed and remembered by so many across the country. Briar Stewart, CBC News, Edmonton. And one of the people who knew him best, his longtime producer, Jess Milton. It's a tough day for a lot of people around yes. here, and I'm sure especially so for you. We all have our memories, and we see Canadians from coast to coast to coast remembering him. How do you think of him on this day? Um, I think I'm thinking about what many of the people said in that piece. I'm thinking about how he connected us. He connected us to Canada, and he did that with all of those shows, those opening essays. And, you know, he swam in our oceans. He rode our trains. He skated our ice. I'm thinking about how he connected us to each other. And I'm thinking about how he connected us to ourselves, how he did that by reminding us that our actions have echoes and by reminding us that uh, everything is important. And if that's true, then that means we're important too. And that felt good. He did so much of that with his amazing ability to tell stories. Yeah. And yeah. you watched him up close. What was the, what was the secret? What was his secret in storytelling. You know what's funny? I think his secret was that he really, of course he was an amazing storyteller and an amazing performer, but he was really first a tremendously good listener and a tremendously good observer. So, you know, if you were to join us um, on a, after a show on a Vinyl Cafe tour bus, you'd see that it wasn't Stuart up there standing and performing. He was always watching what was going on. He was always listening to what was going on. He was always feeling what was going on. We'd go into towns um, three, four, five, seven days before we recorded a Vinyl Cafe show just to do that, just to listen to people and talk to people and sort of just live the lives that they're living, right? So we would arrive in Medicine Hat four days before and we'd uh, get up first thing in, in the morning and sort of go our separate ways, although first thing in the morning to Stuart was sort of around noon. Uh, and we would uh, talk to anyone who would talk to us. We'd talk to the woman at the laundromat or the person who served us coffee or somebody walking their dog. And we would say, what was, what's life like for you? One uh, quick last question. Mm -hmm. um, because you knew him so well, um, we all thought we knew him. Yeah. But you knew him really well. Yeah. Tell us something that would surprise us about him. I think 
what would surprise you is that um, he, he loved those moments on stage connecting to the audience and of course he loved the laughter and when we think of Stuart we often think of that wave of laughter that sure. comes especially with a laugh of recognition we can all see ourselves in the stories he tells I think what would surprise you is that even more than the laughter he loved profound silence he loved that feeling when 5,000 people in a hockey arena were really quiet they weren't checking their phones they weren't unwrapping candies they weren't even laughing they were just there with him and feeling connected to what he was saying. Well, a lot of people quiet tonight. I'm thinking about him. Yeah. Thanks, Jess. Thank you. We'll have uh, quite a bit more on Stuart McLean a little later in the broadcast, including an excerpt from one of his most popular stories. And for an in-depth look at his life and legacy, tune in to CBC Radio 1 tomorrow afternoon for a special broadcast, Canada's Storyteller, a tribute to Stuart McLean. That's at 1 o'clock, 1.30 in Newfoundland. And you can get more reaction to Stewart's passing on our website, cbcnews.ca. Well, to Washington now, Donald Trump may be insisting that the chaos in his White House is the work of dishonest media, illegal leaks, and disgruntled Democrats. But today, members of Trump's own party were as loud in their demands for answers about the administration's connections and communications with Russia. At least one senior Republican called for the fired national security advisor, Michael Flynn, to testify before Congress about his phone call to the Russian ambassador. Wiretaps reveal the two discuss U.S. sanctions imposed by the Obama administration. All that as new reports revealed Trump aides spoke to Russian intelligence agents multiple times during the election campaign. Our Lindsay Duncombe has the latest from Washington. If Americans knew who Donald Trump's team was talking to during the election campaign, would the outcome have been different? Some Republicans think so. If we had known what we know now four months ago, there would be a different president of the United States. The newest revelations come from the New York Times, that people close to Trump had constant communication with Russian intelligence agents during the campaign. The reports say American spies picked up the calls during routine surveillance. Among the aides identified former campaign chair Paul Manafort, who was dropped from the Trump team in part because of his ties to Russia. Speaking to the Times, Manafort denied he spoke with Russian agents, adding, it's not like these people wear badges. Former National Security Advisor Michael Flynn was also reportedly intercepted chatting to Russians. He's the guy who was fired Monday for misleading the White House over conversations he had with the Russian ambassador during the transition. The New York Times stresses there is no evidence of any deliberate collusion between the campaign and the Kremlin, but the Russia links are piling up. Consider, these conversations were picked up around the same time intelligence officials say the Russians were hacking the Democrats. And when Trump said this, about Hillary Clinton's emails. Thank you. Russia, if you're listening, I hope you're able to find the 30,000 emails that are missing. As recently as yesterday, the White House denied the campaign had any contact with Russia. I don't have any, I, there's nothing that would conclude me that anything different has changed with respect to that time period. <laughs> At a press conference with the Israeli Prime Minister, Trump only took questions from two conservative reporters. He simply praised Flynn, the man he fired two days ago. I think it's really a sad thing that he was treated so badly. And blamed intelligence agencies, the media, and Clinton supporters for leaks. It's criminal action, criminal act, and it's been going on for a long time before me. But now it's really going on. And people are trying to cover up for a terrible loss that the Democrats had under Hillary Clinton. Congressional Republicans vowed to investigate their president. The latest information in the media is, uh, requires questions to be answered. Do you think there's any evidence of coordination between the Trump campaign and... It's too early. I think it's too early, but it raises serious questions. The bottom line is... Uh, the leaks to the press are outpacing the information available to Congress right now. And so we're operating in a situation in which we don't have all the facts before us. 
The Senate Intelligence Committee is already looking into Russian interference in the campaign, but Democrats want an independent commission. In the meantime, there's a word we keep hearing around here, chaos. Lindsay Duncombe, CBC News, Washington. That's right, chaos with so many potential ramifications. Keith Bogue has, of course, been covering all this in Washington as well. Keith, what's, what's important here? Well, the important thing is that the White House is in a crisis and it's not managing it well. It's not an overstatement to call it a crisis. After all, the president filed, fired his national security adviser this week and they've only been in office for a month. And nor is it an understatement to say that they're managing it badly. They haven't even been able to keep their story straight about why General Flynn was fired in the first place. Yesterday, the White House said it was because Flynn had lost the trust of the president. Today, the president said that uh, Flynn was a wonderful guy, that he'd been undermined by the media, whom he called the fake media, and by criminal leaks from the intelligence uh, establishment. So it's as though Trump isn't even conceding that he, in fact, had to do with firing. General Flynn. And all of this is happening in an atmosphere of confusion in the White House. There are reports pretty much every day of competitions among the White House, the senior White House staff, rivalries about who really is in charge there, who is the first among equals. And all of that is happening in a background where, as one senior military official pointed out this week, the government, the executive of the government, is in this unstable uh, situation while the country is at war. You know, the questions about Russia specifically, how, how dangerous could they be to the White House? Those questions are probably the most serious threat to the White House. They go back to the campaign, you'll remember, Peter, when uh, Donald Trump was unwilling to answer any questions about why he was so, what his relationship with Russia was and why he was so friendly with Vladimir Putin. And then when he became the president, he continued in that vein, even when the uh, intelligence community was bringing him evidence that the Russians had tried to interfere in the U.S. election. That's a national security issue. And because it's a national security issue, you see it's beginning to get bipartisan support to get to the bottom of it. And if Congress does get to the bottom of it, depending on what they find there, the implications could conceivably threaten Trump's presidency. All this just one month in. It's month. amazing when you think of it, right? I don't think we've seen anything like this before. And even the biggest naysayers about Trump couldn't have anticipated anything happening like this this quickly. All right. Keith, thanks very much. Keith Bogue in Washington. Well, the Kremlin's reaction to all this, much like the reaction from the White House today, was denial. Kremlin spokesman Dmitry Peskov said reports of contacts between Trump's team and Russia are, quote, not based in any fact. Russia also responded to White House expectations aired yesterday that Russia hand back Crimea, which it seized from Ukraine in 2014. The answer from Russia's foreign ministry was unequivocal. Мы свои территории не возвращаем. Крым является территорией Российской Федерации. Quote, we don't give back our own territory and Crimea is Russian. Three weeks in, the Trump administration is swimming in stormy seas of suspicion and doubt from both within and outside government. So how bad is it? David Frum has worked with the George W. Bush administration and watches Washington full-time as a senior editor with The Atlantic. Earlier today, I got his take. So you've got on, on this side of the picture a lot of reasons to believe not only that this is a, a government in crisis, in chaos, but, you know, it could be tipping over. On the other side, you have in Trump somebody who we've shown in the last couple of years that we often miscalculate yes. in terms of his staying power, uh, his deal-making, his whatever. Where are we between those two pillars? Well, he's a very savvy communicator. Nobody knows the system better than me. He's not eloquent. He did, when people think great communicator, they think of soaring rhetoric or they think of Barack Obama's elegant sentences. But in a modern social media world, it's the kind of Trump's very direct method actually communicates better. Which is why I alone can fix it. He's spoken to the anxieties and strongest feelings, good and bad, of a big part of the population in a way that no Republican has done in a long, long time. He has a tremendous grip on his party. He's got a lot of assets. 
And he also has some better instincts. And the, the people always on the shows, because the senators and congressmen are more available, they, they tend to think, well, you know, they're the real power brokers. But Donald Trump has, an, has a better idea of what is popular in the country than Paul Ryan does. Paul, Paul Ryan's agenda is not popular. He wants big tax cuts. He wants to scale back a lot of social spending. He wants to uh, repeal Obamacare and not replace it with very much. And Donald Trump has his instinct that those things are dangerous things to do. You can watch the full interview with David Frum this weekend on One on One. 6.30 Saturday on CBC News Network, 12.30 Sunday on CBC Television. Well, as you heard, while today's chaos raged in the background, Donald Trump played host to Israeli Prime Minister Benjamin Netanyahu. Amid the frozen smiles and tortured photo ops of an international visit, Trump managed to signal a major change in U.S. policy toward the Middle East. Katie Simpson has that story. First official meetings between world leaders are typically about setting a tone for a new relationship. But with Israeli Prime Minister Benjamin Netanyahu in town, Donald Trump skipped that step and jumped into the Middle East peace process. So I'm looking at two state and one state, and I like the one that both parties like. <laughs> I'm very happy with the one that both parties like. I can live with either one. Trump's comments are a dramatic departure from long-standing U.S. policy that supports a two-state solution. For decades, American officials firmly advocated for the creation of a Palestinian state alongside Israel. Netanyahu seemed to appreciate the new president's overall support. I believe that under your leadership, this change in our region creates an unprecedented opportunity to strengthen security and advance peace. While Trump pledged to stand with Israel, he also called for compromises from all sides in the peace process. I'd like to see you hold back on settlements for a little bit. Uh, we'll uh, work something out. In December, the U.N. voted to condemn Israeli settlements in the West Bank. Please At the time, Trump was waiting to take office, but he didn't hold back in criticizing the decision. Now that he is president, Trump proudly showed off his pick for special envoy to the Middle East, his son-in-law, Jared Kushner. Although he has no diplomatic experience, he has close family ties to Netanyahu, who once stayed overnight at the Kushner family home. That appointment, along with Trump's warm message, had both so leaders talking about long-term peace deals. Let's try it. Doesn't sound too optimistic, but that's... <laughs> it's a good negotiator. That's the art of the deal. Palestinian officials have expressed frustration about talk of a one-state solution, and there are new warnings that a U.S. policy change could undermine American interests in the region and create instability. Katie Simpson, CBC News, Washington. Trump's defense secretary took his boss's message about NATO straight to Brussels today. General Jim Mattis told NATO defense ministers that if their countries don't want to see the U.S. moderate its commitment to the alliance, they should meet their military spending commitments. Canada is among the NATO members that fall short. Well, we will be right back with more on the enduring appeal of Stuart McLean. It happened so fast, it's hard to describe. <laughs> His soaring voice and common touch earned him a nationwide following. We'll have a portrait of the man behind those stories. Fidel Castro, seen here with his brother Raul, has been a focal point of controversy ever since his Barbudos, his bearded guerrillas, overthrew the Batista regime on New Year's Day this year. His executions of former enemies, his gentle handling of communists, his land reform program involving expropriation of large United States interests, all these things have kept him in the headlines. He was interviewed in Havana by CBC reporter Michael McClear. Like in Canada, we find support to in the public opinion. Last year, by far the sharpest thorn on the American side was Cuba. Raul Castro, the Minister of Defense, one of the most bitter enemies of the United States, his hatred of all things American surpassed only by that of his brother Fidel. Do you think that Canada should continue to trade with Cuba despite the United States embargo on trade with that country? I don't think we should let uh, the United States decision uh, not to trade with Cuba to influence us. 
I think we have to stick to the United States policy. I personally am against any trade with Cuba. Pierre Trudeau was the first leader of a Western industrial nation to step on Cuban soil to be greeted with a warm and friendly double handshake by Fidel Castro since Castro came out of the mountains leading a revolution that started turning Cuba into a communist state in 1959. At a quick news conference, Trudeau was asked if he was concerned about the people back home who were shocked by his presence in a communist state. Well, the category of people which would be shocked by that have long since been shocked by my visit to China and uh, to the Soviet Union, so uh, I guess I can't worry about that. When the Prime Minister arrived, Fidel Castro was there to greet him with a tirade about the United States. El bloqueo contra Cuba. Castro said the blockade is a calumny. He said it's genocide. The Prime Minister made no direct response to him. In his brief remarks, he talked of a new awareness in Cuba. An expression of confidence in the increasing openness of Cuba to the wider world. Most of these people couldn't tell you the name of the Canadian Prime Minister, but they know about Canada. Canada figures high up in their homes. Back now to our top story, the death of Stuart McLean. His loss today leaves, well, many Canadians without that familiar voice, without those compelling stories made so intimate through the warmth of radio. As we remember him and celebrate what he left behind, we know we're lucky to have his work in our archives to share with you again. Here with a bit of Stuart's brilliance is Adrian Arsenault. Today's the day that Dave cooks the turkey. For the times you know you sat in your cars to hear him finish one more Dave and Morley yarn. Morley reached out and she touched his elbow and she said on Christmas Day, after we've opened the presents, I want to take the kids to work at the food bank and I want you to look after the turkey. <laughs> I can do that, said Dave. For all those days, you just stood in the kitchen, lost in the vinyl cafe. Take a moment to step back into that space. And he got a ladle of the turkey gravy and he ran around the house smearing gravy on the light bulbs. <laughs> the house smelled just like Christmas dinner. A storyteller so distinct, the best one to poke fun at Stuart McLean was always Stuart himself. There's hockey night in Canada. Dragging out Final the tail, Cafe just style. part of the chunk. Kessel wires the puck to Phaneuf. That pass was crisper than an Okanagan apple. Phaneuf lets it fly from the blue line. The puck floats toward the top corner, the way the wind catches a kite on the first day of summer. Well, up, up, up. Ding, it rang off the post like an old-fashioned telephone. It rang like, like a dinner bell. Dinner bell that might call the farmhands in from the field. Why, well, everyone heard it. Except for Dave, of course. Dave was out buying Morley a hot chocolate. Morley has an uncanny ability to send Dave out for hot chocolate just in time for him to miss things like that. Not many others could weave a nine-minute wonder out of the story of a shriveled carrot he left sitting on his desk. Now I thought if this poor little mummified carrot's life had any meaning, it was to tell me that it was high time for me to get aboard the water wagon. Forgive the flashing forward so to how he ended this story. Stuart McLean, now overly hydrated, on a highway with no exit in sight. I looked at the eight lanes of traffic whizzing around me, at the concrete retaining walls, the narrow shoulders, and I realized I was in serious trouble. <laughs> so have you ever tried to cross your legs while you're driving a car? <laughs> A lover of great stories who didn't just offer them, he attracted them. He made it seem so simple. Set up a table, a microphone, and just listen. We teach our children not to talk to strangers. It is, thankfully, a rule we don't much follow. We like to talk to each other, us strangers. And somehow, when we're thrown together on planes or trains, 
or ferry boats. We find it easier than usual to do that. Stuart McLean did this 20 years ago on a ferry in BC. For a while, I, I um, in England, I, was, I worked for Playboy. I was a Playboy bunny. And... Um, Wait a minute. You were a Playboy bunny? That was in bunny? London, yes, yes, yes. What was that like? It was interesting. I mean, you met so many... Marlon Brando, Omar Sharif, Paul McCartney, Ringo Starr. Did you have to sleep with Hugh Hefner? No, I didn't have to, no. Tell me some of your other wishes. I want a billion dollars. Uh-huh. Oh, yeah. I want to see my dad more. Uh-huh. I wanted to meet my grandpa who died when I, before I was born. Uh-huh. And I want to make a lot more friends. What makes a friend? Why is somebody, what makes a friend for you? Um, just when I meet someone, they just be like nice to me. And then like my first friend was probably Matthew, Matthew Mel. I met him in preschool. Well, it was during Second World War, it was exciting, I mean, bad and sad. And I was in a camp for a year and came out of it luckily. It was only 74 pounds when I came out and survived. You were in the camp during the war? Yes. Which one? It was Camp Rotgau. And what was it like there? Uh, terrible. Uh, cold, miserable. Uh, Did you uh, used to dream of escaping? Oh, yes, we did escape. One night we were ta all taken out, out of the camp and we had to go because they were afraid of us. Y you wouldn't say so because we had no arms or nothing, but as the Allies came closer, if we would have been liberated by the Americans in Dieburg, I would have cut a few throats. Stuart McLean just tapped into a desire in this fast universe to simply slow it down. For him, turn on your radios, download those archives. It's all that's left. That was really fun, everybody. Thanks for coming and thanks for your joy. Coming up a little later, members of Parliament pay tribute to Stuart. But when we come back, we check in on the other news of this day.
couple of days after meeting President Trump, Prime Minister Trudeau is off again, this time to Europe to talk trade. Trudeau will be the first Canadian Prime Minister to address the European Parliament tomorrow. His message expected to be clear and simple, that the new free trade deal between Canada and the EU, EU is a good thing and should be replicated. But the visit comes at a difficult time on the continent. Populist movements energized by Brexit threaten the stability of the Union. It's rare that a non-binding motion gets much, if any, attention. But the government is making a big deal out of one that MPs began debating tonight. M103 has been called the anti-Islamophobia motion. So you might understand why it's got passion so high. Catherine Cullen has the story. When dozens of MPs start filing in, it's clear something's up. This motion has become profoundly political. Our government is voicing a strong and clear support for Motion 103. Motion 103 was put forward back in December by Toronto Area MP Ikra Khalid. The part that's attracted so much attention calls on the government to, quote, condemn Islamophobia and all forms of systemic racism and religious discrimination and have the Heritage Committee develop an approach to stopping it. We need to recognize that we have a problem and we need to tackle it head on. She and her supporters point to the Quebec City mosque attack as horrifying new evidence of the problem. Are you with me? But some opponents of the motion, like those gathered in Toronto tonight, express fear, even fury, over the idea that this will lead to criminalizing anyone who wants to criticize Islam, though the motion proposes no such thing. Most conservative leadership contenders are lining up to say they won't support the resolution. And what I'm hearing from my constituents and across the country is they're worried about it, that they are worried about whether or not they're going to be able to say certain things about, for example, criticizing Sharia law. I also am very concerned that these types of motions could lead to bills that limit free speech. Liberal supporters of the non-binding motion say that's just not true. The free Muslim speech is still Jewish. free speech. Hate speech is still hate speech. And we still have those laws in Canada. This motion is if the Liberals thought they might paint the Conservatives into an ugly corner, the Conservatives pushed back with a different motion denouncing prejudice against all religions. But Khalid says she won't remove the word Islamophobia from hers. I will not do so any more than I would speak to the Holocaust and not mention that the overwhelming majority of victims were six million followers of the Jewish faith. And it does seem that there is at least one limit to the Liberals' concern, namely the border. The Heritage Minister was asked today why her party didn't denounce Donald Trump's ban on travellers from several Muslim-majority countries. She said this motion is about what happens in this country. Catherine Cullen, CBC News, Ottawa. Malaysian authorities have detained two suspects today in the apparent assassination of Kim Jong-nam, half-brother of North Korean leader Kim Jong-un. This grainy CCTV image shows one suspect wearing white. She had a Vietnamese passport, but South Korean intelligence believes she is an agent on orders from Pyongyang. North Korean officials spent hours today trying unsuccessfully to halt Kim Jong-nam's autopsy. A day after a deadly attack on a Winnipeg bus driver, a chill has spread through the city's transit system with operators questioning just how safe they are behind the wheel. Police have now laid charges in the case, but as Cameron McIntosh tells us, that hasn't made drivers feel any more secure. A blue rose and a Superman figurine. That's how Tracy Garand saw her now slain co-worker. I said to him, oh, what's your name? And, and he said, Superman. She says he intervened when she was attacked on her first week on the job. A guy had come by and grabbed my bag and kind of swung me a bit and all I seen, I kind of turned and I seen this blue flash. Yesterday morning, 58-year-old Irvin Fraser was killed on the job outside his bus. Such a great guy, like this is just, just horrible, like you just, uh... At 1.55 a.m., Fraser was at the final stop of his route here at the University of Manitoba. After asking the last passenger remaining on the bus to leave, there was an altercation. A verbal argument continued, resulting in a physical altercation outside the bus when a knife was produced and Fraser was stabbed multiple times in the upper body. Fraser died shortly after. 
The accused, 22-year-old Brian Kyle Thomas, has been charged with second-degree murder. He has a lengthy history of assault and weapons charges. As flags fly at half-mast at city buildings, drivers are questioning their safety. Their union is calling for changes, so drivers aren't left alone to deal with belligerent passengers. The routes should terminate in a central location, uh, perhaps downtown, uh, where there could be on-street um, support, uh, an on-street supervisor or, or a team. Everybody's a little on edge. Um, you can't blame us, right? While this is an extreme case, assaults on transit drivers are common in Canada. Recent changes to the criminal code allow for tougher sentencing. In the meantime, Winnipeg Transit says it will be reviewing its safety protocols. Cameron McIntosh, CBC News, Winnipeg. And a controversy over Winnipeg's new police headquarters is shaking up City Hall. The mayor's cabinet has approved a motion calling for a public inquiry into a possible dirty money trail. RCMP allege a Winnipeg construction company quietly shoveled $200,000 to a former top city official. They say the cash was meant to help win the contract for the police headquarters project, a job that cost over $200 million. Police are also looking into whether former mayor Sam Cates received secret cash as well. Residents of St. John's were digging out today after a brutal winter storm. High winds and heavy snowfall created whiteout conditions across eastern and central Newfoundland before finally tapering off today. The two-day siege dumped over 60 centimetres in some areas, bringing life to a standstill. The storm is now hitting the northern part of the island. And people in the Maritimes are hunkering down again tonight as yet another snowstorm descends on Atlantic Canada. New Brunswick and Nova Scotia will get the worst of it. High winds and 25 centimetres of snow are expected. Well, story now about the kindness of strangers, a little boy with autism and craft dinner. You know, I love it. Six-year-old Everett Botwright won't eat many foods, so when he found a new favorite in craft dinner's Star Wars mac and cheese, his parents tried to buy a boatload. Trouble is, it's no longer being made. So Dad Reed went to social media this past weekend for help, and boy, did he get it. Dozens of boxes of Star Wars KD have already arrived, and hundreds more for Everett are on the way from across the country. It's been amazing. I, and the outpouring of support, the individuals, uh, the grocers, um, has just been incredible. And late today, Kraft pitched in too. It's sending its last 12 cases of Star Wars KD to the family, plus a few other fun shapes for Everett to try. Selfie sticks have become a ubiquitous gadget of the digital age, used by young and old. But few Canadians know it was invented by one of our own, and he's about to launch a new piece of selfie technology, one he hopes will be just as popular. Diane Buckner reports. This, this was the patent for the uh, original. Toronto inventor Wayne Fromm is credited as the inventor of the selfie stick. I, I used to describe the selfie stick as the world's first handheld extendable monopod. Isn't that got a lot of a ring to it? <laughs> he branded it the Quick Pod. A patent for a similar device had been filed in the 80s, but it was Fromm's $20 gadget that caught on big time in 2011. Yes. The Quick Pod available at Amazon.com for $17. Camera mad consumers all over the world went crazy for it, even presidents and daredevils. And despite the patent, cheap knockoffs started popping up everywhere. So now not all of these are yours, right? Uh, the best ones are. <laughs> Some copycats even use Fromm's pictures on their packaging. But who are these manufacturers that used your pictures? I have no idea. I have no idea. Fromm did challenge some of the knockoff companies successfully in court, but he simply couldn't fight them all. Unless you're a huge corporation, really it's a battle of resources. That's what it boils down to. A patent doesn't protect you in the sense that uh, no one is going to come running to your rescue. This it's lawyer not. says patents do give inventors exclusive rights. A patent gives you the right to sue someone for patent infringement, but it's still up to you to do that. And sometimes that can be challenging. 
rather have a brand than a patent. Now Fromm is getting ready to launch a new yeah. selfie product. It has a proprietary uh, sticky surface on it. And the selfie stick it allows you to attach your phone or camera to any vertical surface and operate it with a remote. Fromm thinks it will be less annoying than the unwieldy sticks. But his real brainstorm could be his pricing plan this time around. We want to have the dollar stores, we want to have you know, the, the, the Bed Bath & Beyond type stores and the professional camera stores and the Best Buys with the higher price. By selling a $5 model, Wayne Fromm is hoping to beat the cheap knockoff artist to the punch and keep a larger chunk of the selfie market to himself, a market now estimated to be worth $80 million worldwide. Diane Buckner, CBC News, Toronto. Up next, we turn back to our top story, the passing of our friend and colleague, Stuart McLean. The master storyteller had big fans in the halls of power. Time to check the day's business numbers. The dollar moved only fractionally, but it was another record closing high for the TSX and also for the Dow and the NASDAQ. Oil dipped nine cents a barrel. I think a lot of the fellas make the mistake of looking for a, a girl that's absolutely perfect. Of course, I mean, you like to try and make her as uh, almost perfect as you can, but, oh, I think you should learn to get along with the bad qualities and the good qualities. What's your opinion on this business of going steady? Well, it's something that, uh, well, it just shouldn't be. You mean it hasn't happened to you yet? Well, not exactly. It will someday. Don't, don't look so <laughs> smug. <laughs> I started dating when I was about 12 or 13. Well, so the prestige of having a boyfriend. I don't know, I think you get too tied down. It's almost like getting married. How do you make up your mind how far you're going to go on a date? Or it depends on the girl. <laughs> <laughs> well, I've recently met a fellow who believes that without exception, men, women, whether they're separated, divorced, or three-time losers, still cling to the hope that somehow, somewhere, there's someone just for them. He's Morton Victor, who tried to speed the process of natural selection by organizing a singles festival. Being single could be very frustrating, it could be very depressing at times. Just came to meet some nice young girl. Well, maybe in the sense to meet somebody. Well, to meet some girls. You have to go looking for men? No, I don't, but I mean, there's something new or something like that. I don't know. <laughs> single and lonely and looking for love. A growing number of Canadians find themselves in precisely that situation these days. The big problem today is the eternal one of finding someone who thinks you're as kind, sweet, sexy, sophisticated, witty and intelligent as you know yourself to be. Where, oh where, to find such an extraordinary animal. When your opening line is in a newspaper, you can say whatever you want. It's something single people in Toronto are doing more than ever. You have total and complete um, anonymity. Do you believe that you can find the woman of your dreams? If you have the persistence to not be disappointed, by all rights, the heart should take over when you do meet the right person anyhow. Zippity doo da, zippity day. My oh my, what a wonderful day. Hey! Ryan Gosling is on top of the world. Well, at least the entertainment world. He's a Mouseketeer. Home. It's really neat because he kind of laid low and he did, um, you know, think just he said, you know, we picked out of a lot of talented kids and everything, Ryan, and you know, I wanted you to know that uh, you're a Mouseketeer. And I went, no way. And my mom just, she hit the roof. My biggest feeling was just that I was so happy for Ryan. I was happy that he was, uh, that he got a yes answer. Ryan had already caught a lot of eyes with his feet. He'd won an Ottawa talent show, Homegrown Cafe, and several dance competitions in the United States as well. But it was his clean-cut looks and his singing which won him an audition with Disney officials last month in Florida. She let Now, after signing a one-year contract, he'll do singing and dancing on the Mickey Mouse Club. To me, it's luck because there was kids there that were just phenomenal, so luck. <laughs> Yeah, 
in his aw shucks, easygoing manner. He stripped down the facade and told real truths about who we are as a country, not just the nation we are, but the nation we aspire to be. Well, it's been a sad day here at the CBC and for all Canadians who loved Stuart McLean. Upon landing in France tonight, the Prime Minister tweeted his reaction. On the Vinyl Cafe and in communities across the country, Stuart McLean told uniquely Canadian stories, he wrote. We'll miss his humour and humanity. There was also reaction and memories of Stuart on Parliament Hill. Stuart McLean was one of our best storytellers. He was able to unite neighbours, communities through his stories that touched us. As a national treasure, uh, someone who was able to give voice to a program that was quintessentially Canadian. I mean, so uh, unapologetically sentimental and heartwarming, and I always felt it gave us the best of ourselves. I've known Stuart all my life. Uh, our cottages were beside each other in the Laurentians, and my family and his uh, grew up uh, at the same lake. So he's always been that person. All the humour, um, all the incredible insights, that's Stuart McLean. That's the way he was in real life as well. Ultimately, he made us laugh, he made us cry. He was one of our best Canadian artists. In the summer of 2015, just before the national campaign launched, Stuart kayaked over from his dock to our dock, came in, saw my mom, whom he had known since he was a kid, sat down with the whole family, shared his vision of, uh, of a fairer Canada, and it was an inspiring moment. He wasn't running for anything. He was just being Stuart, our old family friend, and he really was that guy. Generous, kind to a fault, loved by everybody who came into contact with him. I went to one of the Christmas shows in Victoria a few years back, and you know, to see a, a full, full auditorium of people cheering, like rock star status for a man who stood at a microphone and told stories in a very Canadian version of Jimmy Stewart, kind of long drawn out and going to tell you the story, but we'll always miss Stuart McLean and we'll always miss David Morley. We sure will. A lot of emotion out there tonight. We're going to give the last word to Stuart tonight and we'll tell you again about the CBC Radio tribute set for tomorrow. That's all coming up in a moment. Stay with us for that. I'm Laura Lynch. Tomorrow on The Current, author Richard Haas says chaos and disarray play a big part in global affairs, thanks in large part to a lack of respect for the integrity of sovereign states. That's on The Current weekdays at 8.30 on CBC Radio 1. playing record are one thousandth of an inch wide. From cutting to wrapping, the disc is processed by a dozen or more men whose sole preoccupation is to ensure that the original sound will be preserved in all its clarity and brilliance on the mass-produced article. From the moment the first Sony Walkman made its appearance in this country, Canadians have taken to the little toys like beavers to trees. Yes, I'm on my way. Music to go. Whatever your taste, you can now take it with you. No one need ever know that you're marching to the beat of a different drummer. In spite of the success of Canadian artists, the domestic record industry has gone through four straight lean years. It's estimated that home taping, pirating, is costing the industry at least $100 million a year in lost sales. And that's nothing compared with the upheavals that lie ahead. The latest innovation in hi-fi sound is the digital audio disc. It could make your old phonograph records as obsolete as the wax cylinders of Edison's day. Beneath the clear plastic coating are little lands and grooves that are read by a laser. Turntables for these new miracle discs will cost over $1,000. Customers snap them up as fast or faster than the manufacturers turn them out. And every record and tape is being converted to compact disc from Buddy Holly to Beethoven. 
It's also the kind of music that's all over the internet in MP3 format. And many of those young fans know a lot about the internet. So instead of buying the hits, a lot of them just download them for free. Music World filed for bankruptcy protection on Friday following other Canadian retailers, like Sam the Record Man, forced to close their doors amid increased competition from big box retailers. And more and more Canadians going online to download music, either from illegal file sharing sites or legit services like iTunes. Ten years ago, when iTunes began selling music online, the music industry looked on with grave suspicion. But today, iTunes has become one of the few reliable revenue streams. Last year, it became North America's biggest music seller. Google has entered the digital music business. It's launched its new service in Canada today. Like iTunes or Spotify or Pandora or Songza or a number of other services, you'll be able to buy a subscription to stream music. Because you know I'm all about that bass, about that bass, no trouble. I'm There's always been change in the music industry. There's been change ever since we started and, and it will continue to change. That bass, no trouble. I'm all about that bass, about that bass, bass, bass. Well, in just a moment, we'll reach into the archives again and let Stuart McLean have the last word tonight. The beloved storyteller passed away today at age 68. Now, just before we show you that, a reminder, CBC Radio 1 will have a tribute for Stuart tomorrow at 1 o'clock local time, 1.30 in Newfoundland. And as always, for news at any hour, you can go to our website, cbcnews.ca. I'm Peter Mansbridge. Thanks for watching on this special night. Now, Stuart McLean himself about his writing and why humor is so important for us all. The great children's uh, writer E.B. White said that uh, humor has an added dimension, that it, that it can take people to uh, that place where tears and laughter meet, where they fall from one to another and they can't trust their emotions. Uh, he said it can do that because like poetry it has an added dimension and, uh, and when it does it, it uh, takes people close to the big hot fire that is truth. So when I'm writing, uh, I, I, I'm always trying uh, to take people to the place of laughter, but also to uh, the place where laughter meets tears. <laughs>